Oh, well, I can't have an opinion <laughs> about a bit of technology now. Come on. You, not te- no, you can have an opinion about technology. Just not my technology. Hey, look, you buy this stuff, right? It just happens to work, okay? Have you have you actually started recording yet? Yeah, everything's on. This is all oh, on the, camera. The, this is the all on camera. On. The audio's on. Uh, hello? Okay, on. so I suppose we should probably start the podcast. Let's do it. Yeah, okay. Well, let me just... Uh, hello, I am Lewis, and today this is going to be an an, an interview uh, with Ross Hepburn and his director. Shall I call you director or what? Doug. Which Doug's moniker? Fine. Just Doug. Doug's fine. With Ross and Doug. With Ross and Doug. Because I don't want to go Ross Hepburn and then Doug, because then you'd feel like a subhuman. He's like, I only have the one name, you know? Well, it's not as like as if we're trying to be a partnership or anything. It's, you know, our names are names. It's, it's, Simon and Garfunkel. It's a professional Chazel, name. Yeah. It was always just their first names. Laurel and Hardy. Or surname, Laurel and Hardy. So Ross yeah. and Doug. We're Ross and Doug. We're Ross and Doug. Yeah. Ross and Doug. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I like that. Or yeah. Rug. Yeah. Rug. If, if I was to, yeah. Uh, let's get through the sweep right. Let's sweep the rug. Let's sweep the rug. Sweep the rug. With Ross and Doug. Doug. Sweep the rug sweep with Ross, Ross and Doug. Doug. Sweep the rug with Ross and Doug. There okay. We go. Well, welcome Ross and Doug. Thank and you. I think we should, so to speak, sweep the rug. So, for those of you who don't know, am I? Can I speak to the camera? Hello, people of YouTube and whoever the fuck's gonna watch this. Right. This is Ross. He's a stand-up comedian. Oh, we interviewed Ross last year on the second, almost a year to the day, slightly over a year to the day. I'm Lewis, and this is Doug. These two people are relevant. Really, I'm not. Okay, I'm just here to fill this. I'm joking, right? I have more self-esteem than that, Lewis. We're going to talk to Ross and talk to Doug about the recent documentary film that they have released about Ross's experience at the Edinburgh Festival, better known as The Fringe, or at least... From your the, the fringe is an element of the Edinburgh Festival. Well, it's that? it's the name of the Edinburgh Festival. <laughs> I, isn't, isn't the fringe the unofficial? No, no, no. That's just that, that's just it, though. I mean, there's many different festivals that appear during Edinburgh anyway. I mean, yeah. there's the book festival, there's the international film yeah, festival, the dance festival. There's, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's of a festivals. wine festival. Yeah, you know, not my cup of tea. Yeah. But uh, um, but it's the main fringe. That's the one that seems to get the most mm-hmm. you know buzz about it. Is whenever mm-hmm. you hear the words the fringe. We're going to be speaking about the experience that Ross had at the festival and the experience that Dougie had at the festival and how that relates to why the fuck we're here today. Okay, so we're in the, the White Horse, is it? Yes, it is. Yes, My dad horse. was convinced this place is called the Grey Horse. Was it called the Grey Horse at some point in the past? Could have been darker in the past, I suppose. Yeah, Because, yeah. no, of course, I ask you that because you're obviously the unofficial fucking tour guide of this pub. I have no idea why I asked you I've, I've, I've been here a couple of times. I've done gigs in here. Mm. And it's a good room. It's nice and it's quiet and it's, yeah. you know, a good place yeah. to come. One of my favourite memories of it was when I first gigged in here. It was the same day Doug came over to see the gig. Mm. And uh, one of the comedians gave him a lap dance during, during When the was gig. this, roughly? This was back in uh, October or November or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was coming up for Christmas. Yeah, it's coming up for Christmas. Must have been... Yeah. Um, because you've had a busy year. I mean, I mean, you did a since the last time we spoke. You have done a, a short Christmas Carol. You you were performing over Halloween last year. Uh, you did the festival this year, and now you have this documentary. And we do. obviously, mm, we do. Jumping from your experience of the festival, we're going to speak about the documentary. Hopefully, jump back into your experience of the festival. Mm. And I want you to tell me in a few minutes a bit more about what that experience was like. But to give you some more context. As to what we're dealing with here, we've got a 30 minute documentary, which I think is the largest thing you've attempted so, thus far. It's the. I, th- I think it would be cheating to say it's the longest thing I've made. Yeah. Just because it's, it's not. It's not the same as making a 30 minute long yeah. film because you're using real life footage. You, you can capture as many, as much of that as you want and yeah. turn it into a story. But. Um, as far as content goes, it's definitely the longest thing that, um, that we've done. Yeah. I don't know mm. if I made things longer back when I'm like working with my dad's little security camera yeah. when you're about mm. nine years old mm. where you go on forever but yeah um our, our collaborative work it's a good 10 minutes longer than the next thing shortest so yeah yeah not that um i don't know it's quality over quantity but mm. i'd like to think the quality's pretty good as well yeah. I, I think what we got from the film worked i mean obviously we set out to do another big project we didn't yeah. know what the other big project was going to be but we just had the idea we thought let's do another big project. And I was trying to write something. I was trying to write another 20 minute film, you know, another little comedy for the channel. But then obviously when, you know, 
August was coming up, we had I uh, started having this, you know, the idea of saying, well, why don't we just document what I'm doing? Mm. And uh, I initially wanted it to be for seven minutes, you know, or a little ten minutes. Just thing. a short one, yeah. Just of a course. short. But yeah. again, with me and Doug, since you know we get so much of what we need, we ended up going over that amount, and mm. you know, we ended up getting the full thirty minutes that we have. Oh, yeah, wanted, wanted to kind of try and pu- push ourselves. I mean, um, ah, uh, well, I mean, you. You'd still have been going through all the same experiences anyway, regardless to whether or not I was there with a camera. Oh, so, yeah. so really, I guess that was just a way for me to push myself. Mm-hmm. Um, Ross, uh, with it being his first Fringe Festival, he was pushing himself anyway. So yeah. just me being there document it was yeah. sort of the, the cherry on top, mm. really. Absolutely. And let's talk about this. So, so your experience of the Fringe this year, is it, sa- is it fair to say, safe to say that this is completely different from your experience, say, last year when you were playing far fewer shows this year? You mm. played something like 19 shows, am I, I did correct nine, in that assertion? I, I did do 19 shows, which was more than last year, which was uh-huh. none, <laughs> yeah. essentially. Well, yeah. I mean, had you, you had played slightly before the festival last year. I did, You'd yeah. been heavily involved in it, but you hadn't really been in it right. all that often. Then you played immediately after in that September and the October time? I did it? I did the October time. Uh-huh. That's when I really sort of started to sort of push myself out there yeah. to get really So when popular. you rolled out the show, McGowan. Yeah, it was really before. just. It was just a really more sort of an an idea of right. Okay, I've just quit my job at uh, at the pub, so I might as well try and push myself out to see uh-huh. what, if I can really do this stand up thing. Yeah. And then October rolled around, and I immediately started, you know, trying to get gigs at the Beehive, and I got them, you know. Yeah. And I started talking to people who were wanting to say, okay, we'll probably get you to gig here as well. Yeah. And it was just a sort of process of getting that getting that ball rolling to say, okay, maybe I can still do this, and it's yeah. the one thing I do want to do. And, uh, and then we get come to now, come to August, and I've done 19 different shows with different yeah. people. In a month. In yeah. a month. Which is fantastic. Yeah, five venues. And five venues yeah. as well. I mean, and during the whole process of that, I think it'd be safe to say that this is not so much a fly on the wall documentary because there's parts of this documentary where you're 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 providing a, a video diary over mm. the course of and, and did you do that for every day of the fringe or? not every day not every no. day certain days yeah. uh the idea was uh doug said to me um um there may be days where i don't film you mm. and there may be days where i'm working and i went look why don't i buy your old camera yeah and i'll film just sort of sort of like how i felt the day went and things like that and it and it ended up becoming a pretty important tool for me because I was able to sit back and go, okay, this is just what happened to me at this gig. It oh. went well, it didn't go well. This was the best gig ever. This was one of the best gigs I've ever had. This was one of the worst gigs I've ever had. Yeah. And it became that sort of thing of just uh, another voice to sort of vent frustration. Yeah. This is a huge learning experience yeah. because you had made a documentary before, I believe, where uh, you had followed the sort of exploits of. I think you described him as. Can and we we can speak about this? Um, yeah, sure. Sure. There's um, an exclusive story, ladies and gentlemen. You're not gonna hear this anywhere else, you, apart you, from on the internet, <laughs> everywhere. From you you mentioned described him as. Um, yeah. No, he is. He. Uh, I can't describe him as a schizophrenic musician because he just is a he schizophrenic. Is objectively, musician. a schizophrenic uh, um, a musician. We went to college with a guy, and we knew we knew he was crazy. Yeah. I mean, mm. We knew he was crazy, but we didn't think he was this crazy. So um, I, I was in a band with him and I was on and off he'd bug me with calls at first I thought he's just an annoying guy then I I provided the idea I've never made a documentary and you're recording an album I'll document that Mm -hmm. now I feel kind of guilty because I secretly know that I was waiting for the kind of the juicy stuff that was going to happen with his sort of personality because I knew that he was a bit loopy so first day we get all the footage of him recording that's fine second day I turn up at his house and um, you're you're me now. You're you're me. So you be me and ask me, Tommy, what are we gonna do today? Okay, so Tommy, what are we gonna do today? What do you want me to film specifically today? Doogie, I'm gonna perform an exorcism on the house. Right. Oh my you, you, God. You're gonna perform an exorcism on your own house, Tommy. Aye, but, but you can't film it, Doogie. You what? can't film it. That sacrilege, man. The exorcist. That was just a one-off. Right. They shouldn't have done that, Doogie. That was that was unholy. They'll all be like <laughs> dying. They when they go up to the higher life, they'll be going down into hell because that's where they belong because they've been sacrilege. But aye, if you just didn't turn the camera on, I can like. I'll say that all oh, sake on sake or so I'll do the little guten fleck and I'll chuck the holy water on the walls. Holy you fuck. Fuck. But this is and then um, I yeah. thought this is perfect. <laughs> yeah. This is brilliant footage, but I couldn't film any of it and I felt robbed of oh that. My so God. I left. you should have done that one of those things that you know like the the uh, the BBC used to do on Panorama, where you just have a fucking camera concealed in your well, your equivalent of a handbag. And you know, you've just got the, the kind of lateral shot of the top of the desk. 
as he's just yeah, performing you can, the you exorcism. Yeah, you can sort of see the, the yeah. couple of centimetres. Or at least just get the audio footage yeah. and like splice in what I can yeah. essentially describe as like oh Frank Zappa so, so this was video. like a two-day attempt at the documentary. Just a two failed, day for two days failed miserably on the second day. He, he filmed and finished one scene and he yeah. sent it to me and I went, this looks really good. This is yeah. just showing the madness of a guy in a recording studio. And... Mm. Uh, and didn't, didn't work. It didn't work, and I felt bad because I really, I, I thought it could go places. And I met Tommy DeVito. Yeah, he is terrifying. Yeah, he just looks at you with a cold, dead stare. There's a chance there actually. And um, while while this is playing back, I think sort of if I'm here on see see, see about here. Yeah, about here. Though though right now, if you're watching, you'll see a picture of Ross. That's genuine fear of Thomas Davis <laughs> in this picture that I'm hopefully seeing here. If Lewis can be bothered putting it in there, I, I, I will attempt to be bothered to be putting it in. When Ross I put met Tommy, but, but that's what the photo album was called. When Ross met Tommy, and he turns up in a three piece suit. <laughs> yeah, he looked fantastic. That was a funeral outfit, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, he'd just been to a funeral, right? Wow. Yeah, I mean, you hope he had just been to a funeral. We don't know. Um, you assume, but you also hope that he wasn't planning. Yours. I just know if, if it was, if, if it definitely was a funeral, I hope that that person didn't know Tommy. I hope they didn't know yeah. Tommy because, and I hope they weren't killed by Tommy. That's my one premonition, you know. Yeah. I've got a question uh, regarding this this documentary, which was out on Monday. It's about thirty minutes long. You should go, totally go check it out. We're going to link it below this video, okay? Uh, now, one question for each of you. It's the same question for each of you. What was your most difficult, your most challenging, yeah, moment of this year's festival uh, with regard to your performances? Your performances. Mm. And the same question to you with regard to making this documentary. What was your most challenging moment? Do you want to go first? I'll, I'll go first. Go. One of the challenging things about doing this gig was the um, the amount of times that I'd be performing in different days. Like there was days where I'd be performing at uh, eleven o'clock in the morning, yeah, midnight, quarter past quarter to nine, yeah. or nine o'clock, or any of these days. Times were scattered and you know put about mm. the places. And uh, looking back on it, I probably should have paced myself a bit better when I was doing these gigs because there was moments in the documentary where people came up to me and went, you look like hell in this. Yeah. You are so tired. What, what, what were you doing to yourself? And I, I, on top of all that, I was also still doing my job where I was cleaning the Eupostal Cafe for yeah. later fringe hours. That wasn't the hardest part. The hardest part was, you know, there was one gig that I'd done where I had to be there for midnight. Mm -hmm. So I quickly cleaned the cafe got changed to my suit and I ran to the gig. Yeah. Where um, was this gig precisely? It was at the sea venues. Right. And so I was gigging there for the second time. Mm -hmm. The first time I gigged there, I absolutely loved it. It was incredible. You know, I was gigging at a venue that I love. I was there various times to see the Blues Brothers. Yeah. So I was happy to, uh, to perform there. Mm -hmm. And then when I get invited back, it's not the same gig. Absolutely. It wasn't the same gig I did. And it yeah. really tore a hole through me because I, I just imagine. thought, God yeah. damn it. I mean, it really takes it out of you. What about yourself, Dougie? How, what was your most trying moment of the <laughs> Henry Festival 2013? Um, <laughs> actually, um, it, it would probably, you have to, when you watch a documentary, yeah, yeah. it's got to tell some sort of story. Yeah. So I had it's to document something, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. It, like, I guess it was just you. Some days I couldn't film you, so mm. I had to take the footage that I did get yeah. and somehow form it into some kind of story. Um, but as for the actual hardest part itself, probably the stand. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's the whole climax where Ross finally plays the stand, and we try to, for what we had, make it look as big as it sort of yeah. uh, could be. And it's it was just that if Ross did a show any other night. Um, I could just turn up yeah. a couple of days later at a different show and try and get better footage, but there was only one stand show. Yeah. And I had to make, if I, if I fucked up that footage, it was... The documentary it, it was gone. becomes a bit... And yeah. I, I guess the stress as well, I knew if Ross doesn't do well on stage, thank God you did. Yeah. 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 If, you did um, fantastic. If, if you bombed Ross on stage, wasn't. the entire climax would have been depressing. Yeah. I mean, now thankfully it's quite... Uh, you've seen it, I don't know yeah. if it's uplifting when Ross finally goes on stage, don't oh, yeah. spoiler alert, uh -huh. and it, it, it gets the good show that he's always yeah. wanted. That That's just luck, yeah. but that, that was that was so stressful. And speaking of your performance at the stand, yeah. uh, was there that feeling just before uh, you, you went on? Mm. And a feeling of, because of course you, you brought out a video about a month and a half ago, I believe, yeah. speaking about how you were going to be playing the stand, and yeah. you were overjoyed about this. Was there that feeling as before you went on stage where you felt that 
this is one of those moments in my life. Oh yeah, we're just terrified. I've not eaten all day. I've not, you know, had a proper sleep. Mm. I'm just, this has been nerve wracking. And then I saw the queue forming outside and I could see my family. I could see some of my friends. Yeah. I could see people that were- And you know, that's got to be nerve wracking. Well, it was nerve wracking enough. I mean, because it was, to be honest, it was the first time that my mother had ever seen me do stand up. Right. She yeah. had never seen me do stand up before, you know, and I was always nervous about saying to her, yeah, I wanted to be a comedian. Yeah. Because obviously it's my mother. She obviously has higher, she obviously has different expectations for me. She wants yeah. me to do better. And then, you know, I don't know if she ever wanted me to be a stand up. Yeah. But they all came. And uh, Susan Morrison, the wonderful comedian and compare the gig. She never broke Brilliant. a sweat. Never mm. broke a sweat. Brilliant. The whole place was filled. Like, it sold out 160 people. There was no empty seats. Yeah. 160 people. Yeah, and I'm thinking insane. I have never performed to that many people mm. at this. Prior to that, what was the most people you had ever really performed to? It was the uh, Curtain House one night. It was on April, and mm. uh, of seventy folk, yeah. something like that. Seventy push, folk, seventy push night. Yeah, yeah. between fifty yeah. and seventy, something folk, like that. Probably. Yeah. But here's hundred and sixty people, and uh, the minute Susan Morrison goes, "Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the stage, Ross Hepburn," and I just my heart went. Boom, 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 yeah, boom. it would. It was beating like a drum. I'm mm. nervous, and I'm swe I'm sweating already. Luckily, I was wearing a dark suit, so you couldn't see the sweat just pouring out. Yeah. But the minute I got up on that stage, I mean, my dad said to me at the end of it, you had the best stage presence. Mm. Your stage presence was incredible up there. And I'm like, I don't know how, because up Yeah, there, you did have, I noticed that, it's crazy, actually. I noticed that you had great stage presence. It kind of, because you were, you were openly kind of prostrating. Yeah. You, you were quite, <laughs> prostrating is the right word. Audience, uh, go to your keypads. And you're going to vote on the use of the word prostration. Mm. Yeah, is that right in this context? You were moving in quite an organic, synergetic way. Mm. And I feel that you were able to communicate your jokes better to the audience that way. Um, and it's something you don't often see because most people look very robotic and mechanical. Yeah. When they're doing any kind of performance, I find, uh, they're very, they, I mean, it's inhibitions and it's, it's, it's nerves and things like that. So you don't move very much. You, you know, you get some people that say, I don't even want to, you know, lift a finger in case for some reason I trip and fall yeah. <laughs> while I'm doing this fucking thing. But yeah, I, I did find from the footage of, of you at the stands performing, you were definitely very animated. Mm. And, and I think you, you, from what I've seen of you in the past uh, with, 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 with a flash grenade and, and, and your channel in general, it's the, you can almost translate how you feel about the joke. Mm. And in general, more with, with body language and movements. Yeah. I think it was very good. With regard to um, your, both of your experiences at the festival, who was the most interesting person you had met, whether it be someone who was, I suppose, a fan, a viewer of, uh, of, of, of one of these shows Lost that you've done? Guy. Lost voice guy. Lost he, voice he guy. Was, he, he was incredible. I've yeah. never Tell seen him. about him. Right? He was a comedian who had cerebral palsy. Right. And because of this, he had no use of his vocal cords. He couldn't talk. Right. So his comedy came from his voice box. He had a voice unit. And I, he brought an iPad on stage with pre-programmed lines that he would press live really? on stage. And he wow. owned the show. Yeah. He was incredible. And in two years' time, he's going to be huge. Yeah, I love that because cerebral palsy... It's one of those dis uh, conditions, diseases, conditions, uh, conditions that people, it's like something in a kind of Tarantino horrendous way you f can find inadvertently funny. And it's something that people, don't, it's one of those kind of things you go, you feel terrible, but it's amazing that he in full knowledge of that has used that to his own advantage. Oh yeah, oh, you nobody know, could make that, fun of him like he yeah. made fun of himself. Yeah, but like, exactly, way, and that's genius. I really think that in a reflective sense, that's what comedy's all about, yeah. and, and it's really, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I said to him after the gig, because he came off stage and went, you were absolutely incredible. Mm. That was unlike anything I've ever seen. That's amazing. Yeah. And he had that box with him, and he typed in thank you. Yeah. And it was just, you know, he, he, you know, he appreciates it. He's yeah. always got a smile on his face. Fantastic. You know, he's he's... He's going to do great. He's yeah. going to be amazing. And, you know, mm. obviously he's doing better than what I do. Yeah. Well, no, it's, you know, so, unless you've so. got, I mean, unless you have cerebral palsy, it's very difficult to do what he does. Yeah. So I'm not going to hold that against you. And I don't think the audience will either. Mm. But, uh, well, you, you question whether something. or not he did actually have cerebral palsy. Or you no, I believe he had cerebral palsy. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure he one of his opening palsy. jokes, actually. Just, just letting you know, I'm, I'm not drunk. I'm not just a really good actor. And I'm not just in this for the parking space. I have space. cerebral palsy. Yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah. I could he just see someone I mean, thinking that was his name. Cerebral palsy. <laughs> it sounds like it could be a name. I just, I, I just, oh, that's cerebral palsy's on tonight. Five quid at the door. I just remember there's a punk band called Cerebral Ballsy. 
No way. Wait, and I don't know, they sound pretty shit, but yeah. uh, just by the name alone, I'm not interested. Yeah. Kind of a retarded title. I hey. should feel away from that because I have so many jokes about cerebral palsy yeah, okay. in my head. Sorry. Sorry. Next question. <laughs> Next question would be what are your plans for the future? Like, I mean, so, so this is September right now. It's September. Did you know what month it was? Are you high? Are you wanking? Or are you watching this? Huh? It's September, all right? September. It's September now. Next month is October. Mm. And then we have the whole rest of the year. If you could sum up your plans in a few sentences, what's on the table? What's on the cards? I'll, what are you thinking? I'll, you go, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. First, yeah. Um, we're just making a um, public service announcement. announcement. PSA. <laughs> um, within the next two weeks, we'll hopefully be making it. Um, I'd like, I don't know if you agree with me, I've like, I like to describe what it is as an anti-public service announcement. I don't know, I mean, it's not, we are getting a message across. It is, we're getting a message across, it but is, if people use the method that we were asking, yeah. I think... Um, Basically, we're, I had this idea of taking the, the American Psycho scene where uh, Patrick Bateman kills uh, Jared Little to yeah. Huey Lewis in the news. And doing it about giving blood, donating blood. What the fuck? And, and uh, I passed this idea like, on to Doug and went, Wouldn't that be fucking hilarious? And he went, Why on earth would you want to do that? I just thought I'd be so funny. This was, this was your notion. Yeah. We'll yeah. Just, we'll put that just for the record. For the record, right? American Psycho is one of my favorite yeah. books of all time. And it's a great film. And I just mm. thought I would love to parody yeah. this scene. I have actually got the book. I inherited the book, I suppose. Read it. But I've never seen. I've sorry. I've never read the book, but I have seen the film with the axe and he turns on the yeah. stereo and it's the words like, "Hey, hey, Clyde," and then he just like takes him out with a fucking axe. And and it's a crazy, crazy film about this guy that's just obsessed with, with corporate sort of, uh, perfection and you know the, the every element of his personality has just become this kind of whitewashed sort of mechanical businessman. It's great. And, and it's going to get the rug he treatment. Is, and it's going to get the rug insane. treatment. Oh, All yeah. right. He's just going to just going to yeah. ruin forever this oh, yeah, we're much gonna... beloved tale of of psychopathic When, when you murder. edit something, you'll know it yourself yeah. when you're done your podcast. By the mm. time you're finished editing, like, you're sick of it. You don't want to see hate, it ever yeah. again. I fucking hate like, By the end of it, I am just so sick of listening to the entire conversation that when it goes out, I won't listen to it or revisit it again online when I go back to it for at least a couple of months. Me, me and Doug. Uh, I'll listen to it once over and make sure it sounds okay, but after that, I'm so when the, fucking happy to see When we're movie. watching American Psycho on Blu-ray, if it yeah. Yeah, ever release it in Blu-ray, that, that scene's getting skipped once we've and, done this. And just to be precise, this is, this is, the, this is a, a short film you're working on. No, 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 no this no, is no, a, just a, a, a Basically, a that scene in the form of a commercial. In, right. in the form of an advert, yeah. And what is it advertising? Giving is it? blood. Giving blood. Giving blood. Donating Ad blood. Yeah. Right. Since you're working on this at the moment, have you got anything else that's in the pipes? Any more comedy, for example, from your perspective, Ross? I, uh, I'm writing. I'm writing a lot. You're going to be doing a lot of writing. Yeah, well... Because the season does kick up again at about October, November. The time. idea is you have a break in September because yeah. August is such a heavy month. I mean, yeah. now I need to get sleep. <laughs> it's mm. the only thing I want to get out of the way. I want to relax. I want to promote the documentary more. I want to get that sort of at a level where it's the most, one of the most highly viewed videos yeah. on my channel because I want it to be higher than the Shane McGowan video. Yeah. That's my one goal. I just want it to be higher than that, you know? That's because you don't... It, Ross doesn't like the fact that a video of him imitating somebody else is getting more attention than his then, own work. Yeah. The thing about YouTube, as I've discussed this before, it's it's... There are going to be a lot of people who have searched Shane McGowan, yeah, and have found your video Aye. and thought that guy with ginger hair—that's that's Shane. That's, that's Shane. all right. I'll click wow, on that, that one. That glass of apple yeah. juice he's drinking—he's oh, so pissed. Oh, dislike. Yeah. <laughs> it's got five it's, dislikes. You know, you know, the only thing that doesn't make it realistic from from a drinker's point of view is someone looks at it and goes, "I suppose with the context of Shane McGowan," but they go. No one would ever pour that much whiskey into a fucking glass. Because yeah. <laughs> it's apple juice. But like, other than that, I love that video. I think it's fucking fantastic. Spur of the moment. Just yeah. spot, I have an idea. Fantastic got video. Mm -hmm. And the huge fucking over the top uh, crucifix yeah. is amazing. But uh, you should definitely get a bit more Shane out there in the. Sh I would love Sh Shane has a cameo on an another upcoming yes. project. In, our, in our another project, in our next project. We it, was, it, it was in the Christmas video last year. It's yeah, going to be yeah. in the Christmas video yeah. this year. Yeah. So, oh, oh yeah, the, 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 now, now you mentioned the Christmas video this year. Officially, 
announced here. This is the first place you've ever announced it yeah. on this podcast? Yeah. Oh, yes. This is an exclusive. Wait, still there. You didn't hear it anywhere else before now, apart from in the minds of these two gentlemen. Uh, there will be another Christmas film. We shooting for right about the same length as the one you did um, last year, half an hour. Like short well, film, I, I mean. Short film. Half half an hour. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, yeah. we, we'll say it'll be like 20 minutes to half an hour and yeah. it ends up being an hour and 90. Yeah. You know? I don't want to give anything away. Let's just tell people... Um, It'll it, be wonderful. It will be. It'll wonderful. be quick but wonderful. It'll yeah. be quick but wonderful. And uh, look, I will give this away. It'll be in black and white. Yes. That's the only thing I'm excited about when it comes to this film. I mean, uh, I'm not a fan of color. Yeah. I love black and white. Uh, not to be offensive or anything. I've always wondered what software you use just to wrap this up here. I've always wondered what software you actually use. You know quite a lot about film production to do that Sin City thing where there is only one thing in the entire frame which is in color. Did they have to go through all those frames, you reckon, and colour that? Um, that no, there's a... The... Sin City was digital, so there's a, mm. there's a digitised way to do this. Yeah. Um, but as for how to do it, I don't know. I've never had much. Yeah. You, uh, there's there's way yeah. you can enhance colours and yeah. desaturate colours. It's colors, something I've so. always wondered about, actually. And, and Well, I want to thank you both. Anytime. Right. Mm-hmm. And if you want to find out more about what Ross has been up to and what Dougie has been creating Ross... Has been up to that makes any sense. Um, collectively, you collectively, can find us at you can find them at www or World Wide Web to cut out six syllables dot YouTube. That's one dot, not two dots. Okay, we we, under, we are going to assume at this point that you're not complete retard. Okay, so dot YouTube forward slash forward slash stand up Ross or in Dougie's case. That would be uh, www.youtube.com forward slash Snakeville Films. Or just type in my name and you'll find the channel it's linked to. Yeah. It's got a beautiful black and white display that was made by Douglas. And you will find Ross's various escapades under that specific search yeah. criteria. Okay. Is that simple enough for you? Okay. If you want to find my channel, my channel will, funnily enough, be below this video. There'll be a link to it. It's called Shadow Podcasts. Used to be called Channel Channel One, but I changed it because that was a fucking stupid name. Um, thanks a lot for listening. Was there anything else we did? We have a team hug at the end or something. We just shook hands. We just shook. We just shook hands. If you'd like to see a team hug, we'll happily get together once again and put it at the bottom of the video. Thanks very much for having us, Lewis. Thanks a lot for thanks having for, me. Thanks, thanks a lot having, for yeah. indulging me. No problem. Um, thanks for joining us, guys. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Let's get the fuck out. Uh, of you want to? Yeah. We're gonna. We just wanna like this. Like,